I'm Matthew Green. Uh, I'm a climate correspondent at the Reuters news agency. Uh, it's my job to write about climate change and the crisis that we're facing. Um, and I feel very honoured that I've been invited here by the Maudsley Psychedelic Society to be your host and moderator for this evening. We obviously live in an extraordinary moment. Everybody in this room, I suspect, is deeply appraised of the gravity of the ecological crisis that we're facing. And not only that, all the other problems that we're facing in society, from the rise of populism to inequality, and all the kind of havoc that has been wrought by 30 years of, of neoliberal economics. And a lot of people are asking, where are we going? What, what comes next? And at the same time, this extraordinary effervescence has started to bubble up to the surface from the collective in the form of the psychedelic renaissance. I never thought I'd be standing up in front of people talking about this topic until a few years ago when I wrote a book about soldiers looking for new ways to recover from psychological injury in war. That was my opening. It was an extraordinary transformational potential of psychedelic medicines. But now I'm standing as a climate correspondent wondering, wow, is there some connection between this existential crisis we face as a species and this incredible emergence of this strand of psychedelic enlightenment, if you want to call it that, or, or, or whatever else, we'll, we'll find the language perhaps later, but something clearly very weird, uh, but very interesting and perhaps very important for our future is taking place. And we're here to unpack the connections between those two trends this evening. We're going to have a panel discussion a little later on, uh, which I'll be moderating with some great panelists who I'll introduce a little bit later on. Um, and we're also going to have uh, talks from Danny Diskin of the Regenerative Agroforestry Impact, Impact Network, or RAIN, which is doing fantastic work <coughs> restoring Atlantic forests on the coast of Brazil and moving towards working in the Amazon. Uh, we'll also be hearing from Dr. Sam Gandhi, who is affiliated with the Psychedelic Research Group at Imperial and is doing groundbreaking work on <coughs> relations between psychedelics and nature connectedness. Um, and even when, so, so we're going to be having a chance, obviously, for questions and participation a little later on. Um, but even just by being here this evening, you're participating in this renaissance and the money that has been raised from this event, from the tickets, is being divided partly between RAIN to fund the extraordinary work that you're doing to restore these ecosystems that are so vital to planetary health and also to fund the upcoming <coughs> psilocybin for treatment resistant depression trial being staged by Maudsley and in collaboration with King's College. Don't you just hate that term, treatment resistant? It's like, <laughs> surely the problem is that we don't have the right treatment, <laughs> not that the patient is resisting it. So I'm sure that the, uh, the psilocybin trial will, will be a huge contribution to the Renaissance. So, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Danny Diskin, who's going to talk you through his, his extraordinary journey to the forests of Brazil and the role that psychedelics played in catalyzing that transformation. Thank you very much, Dan. This is my coming out party. I, I usually turn up under the name of Dan Nenu, and I'm usually pimping this book here. And um, Sam's going to be really late, uh, so they've got the smiley on me, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about. I was going to have five minutes to tell you about rain, and there's loads to tell you about rain, but I've got, I've got quite a lot of time now, so I'm just going to talk uh, about myself uh, and other things that I like. So please feel free to interrupt me at any point or give me some time to think about what I'm going to say next. 
So, um, I'm going to start by talking a bit about ayahuasca, which is how I got into this. Um, I encountered ayahuasca in the form of Daimi living in Japan uh, about 17, 18 years ago. I've been there for five years. Uh, and then I decided to go to the Brazilian Amazon in order to investigate the roots of this particular uh, lineage, this particular way of using ayahuasca. Daimi is quite different to a lot of other ways of using ayahuasca. The gentleman who was responsible for this, a very tall black man by the name of Mestri Irineo, or Hagul Irineo Serra. And he travelled from the uh, northeast to the northwest of Brazil. In the northeast, you're closer to Africa than you are to the northwest of Brazil, to the jungle. He travelled there during the rubber boom in uh, Brazil, because we were busy fighting wars and we needed rubber for the wars. That was about 1910. So this uh, gentleman went to the jungles of Brazil, uh, working as a water guard, and there he met some indigenous, uh, a couple of people called Kizango, and also the indigenous Huni Kui nation. They taught him how to use ayahuasca. And at that point in history, ayahuasca was used in a quite specific way, although there are lots of tribes all over the Amazon who use it in different ways. Generally, it's used individually, right? The shaman will go off to their hut, drink their ayahuasca, and come back to the clients to tell them what's going on, what disease they have, how they fix it, where, if, where the object that they've lost is, and other kind of forms of, of divination, right? This is something we do quite differently now in the, in the Neil Ayahuasca scene, where everyone drinks Ayahuasca together. That goes back to Mestre and Air. Um, so the traditional way of drinking Ayahuasca is the shaman doing a whole lot of training and then learning something and then coming back. So this is something I want us to think about here, is what are we giving back? What are we giving back to the tribe? Because that's what shamanism is about. Not really, a shaman is a good shaman if they have crazy adventures. Shaman is a good shaman if they come back and deal with diseases and the threats that the, sh that the tribe is facing, right? If they can find game for the tribe, if they can find food, if they can protect its borders, if they can deal with its diseases. So Mestre Yunei started training in this, in, this, uh, in this culture, and that's how he was working. He was working with whistling and ikaros and all that kind of stuff. And people would come to him when they were ill, and he would heal them, and he healed among other people, he healed some of his enemies. Um, there was, uh, I was always being politically complex, right at the beginning, you know, it was uh, in Brazil, it was what the indigenous people did, and they were devils. And Mestre Yunei, who was born in 1892, which was two years after slavery was abolished. So he was born in a racist country, uh, and his hobby, or what he got into, was considered diabolical. And he was practicing this, and he set up his own uh, people coming to, to, to see him, and then this developed an encampment around him, but mostly black people from the other side of the country. And the police were called in, the police were called in to shut this down. Uh, so off they went, and they circled this encampment, they had guns out. Uh, and they said to him, you're going to resist, or are you going to close this on the down because you worship the devil? And he said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to resist. So they, I'm not going to close it down. So they took him off for an interview. By the end of the interview, this man managed to convince the authorities that not only is he not worshiping the devil, but he was doing good work. And they gave him a chunk of land in what is now the Abranco. And when he arrived there, he immediately got his people to start planting food, right? He said, we've got to plant loads and loads of food. And then what happened, quite shortly after that, was an English guy turned up in the jungle. He stole a rubber plant seed. He took it back to Chelsea Physic Garden and he uh, propagated it. And the economy, which was based on rubber extraction, just collapsed completely. And there was a famine in this area. People left the countryside, they went to the city, which became near rubber. Now, during this period, Mestre Yonega was producing 40% of the food during the famine. So this is what this guy brought back from his journeys. He brought back uh, this uh, lifeline to this community. So if you go there today, you get a bus to Irineo Serra. The, the district is named after him. He's a local hero because of this. And Ayahuasca um, has, in Brazil, it's been every legal challenge it's faced, it's done very well. This guy, uh, once upon a time, he was visited by a man who got off the, got off the bus to learn to, because he was interested in ayahuasca. He actually told the man what his name was, 
Uh, he told him what is easy to do, he told him something that happened on the way on the bus. He told him all this kind of stuff. And this is old school shamanism, this kind of divination. So, and he said to this guy, hey, you take this bottle, we'll take it back up to, uh, I think it was Rio de Janeiro, and give it to some of your friends. And one of the friends he gave it to was Gilberto Gil. Gilberto Gil later became the culture minister for Brazil, and uh, he was instrumental in making ayahuasca more legally uh, solid in Brazil. So these are uh, some of the magic that surrounds the tradition that I went to Brazil to learn about. When I got there, um, I found that um, the place I was living at, which was uh, just outside Rio Branco, near the, the Bolivian border, um, they have a, a very aggressively encroaching, uh, let's say, frontier of capitalism there, including their pharmaco uh, medicine, interventionist medicine. And I hadn't been there very long when I got ill. I got bitten by a sandfly and it developed into a pimple, and the pimple developed into uh, uh, a boil. And this is a horrible disease, as some of you have heard me talk before, I've probably talked about before because I dine out a lot on this story. Uh, but I was sick for eight months with a, a flesh-eating parasite in my chest. I lost 10 kilos, I lost uh, an ex-wife, um, I lost loads of things I didn't need. And um, I emerged from the experience um, somewhat sealed. Everyone around me, they, they, they said you have to take injections with stuff. And they said, I didn't come here to take injections, I've come here to learn about ayahuasca. And so, eight months, at the end of this eight months, I met a woman who nursed me back to health uh, towards the end. And um, very shortly after that, we went to Bolivia, I had to skip the country because my visa had expired by this point. And um, went to Bolivia, and in Bolivia, a load of magical stuff happened. I won't go into it. But one of the things that happened was I was in the internet shop and I, someone wrote to me saying, oh, I just got pregnant, I'm very happy. And someone else wrote to me and said, I've just had a child, I'm very happy. And someone else wrote to me, typically wrote and said they dreamt about me, it was interesting. And uh, I wrote to someone and I said, do you think if I go home and get this woman pregnant, all my problems will clear up. And I went home, we went back to the hospital, she opened the door and she said, do you have a child? And I went, yes. And uh, we did. Um, she fell pregnant pretty much straight away, and uh, we had two children actually, we had twins. Um, they were both born with birthmarks in the place that my wound uh, is uh, from this disease, right here. And if you want to see it from there, you can see it So they were both born with birthmarks there. Um, and I took this back to the, the curandero who treated me, and uh, I said, look at my magic. And he went, oh, it's left the tank, has it? Because this is very normal. Very normal in Brazilian shamanism or indigenous shamanism, this kind of poetic uh, vision of the world. And kind of that's normally where the story stops when I'm talking about when I'm being Danny Nemo. I'm not being Danny Nemo today, I'm being Danny Diskin. So then I moved to um, Minas Gerais with this woman. I had to present myself to her parents because she was pregnant. And uh, they were cool with that. Um, they, um, her brother was to be swimming in a uh, in a stream, and the stream, uh, which was lovely, and then five years later, I went back to the stream again, and it dried up. And that region of Brazil, which is here, it's all dried up. Uh, there used to be four, sorry, five rivers in a place called, on the next slide, Pampa Norte, which is where rain started with activities. Now there's one river, and every year it drops. You can see the level of the water uh, going down. That river, the Rio Araçuaí, supplies the Cerrado, which is in the top right hand side of this image, with water. And the Cerrado provides 40% of the water going into the Amazon. And the Amazon rains influence the monsoon rains and the rains in, uh, in Africa. Right, so we're very, very much connected together. Um, thinking psychedelically. Uh, all of this, you, all this sh should look like it looks up there, it looks up left. It should be green, it should be light. You can see the water content is more over the Amazon, obviously, because it contains water better. 93% of the Atlantic forest has been lost in the last 300 years since gold was discovered. And gold was discovered in Minas Gerais. Minas Gerais means general mines, right? It didn't have a name uh, for quite a long time. It was only, it was only, um, it was basically people went there if they wanted indigenous slaves. Uh, but then they discovered gold and started extracting gold 
And gold is highly destructive. Gold extraction is really destructive to the river systems because you will use a lot of mercury. Um, it was sometimes shutting off rivers to prospect, sometimes scraping the edges off rivers. Um, a million slaves brought over in order uh, to work with gold. They all have to be fed. There was a gold rush. So farming, massive mining, and logging has uh, destroyed 93% of the Atlantic uh, forest. And that has impacts uh, on the water cycle of the whole continent. So you've got flooding in the Amazon, you've got uh, water shortages in uh, the south of Brazil, in the urban centres of uh, Rio and Sao Paulo, for example. And here, I mean, desertification is, is happening right before our eyes. <coughs> Uh, so, regeneration, how do we go about regenerating? I think it's interesting, having, having come back from disease, um, I'm kind of interested in more uh, the collective threats that we're facing at the moment. This is Sebastian Falcao, the Brazilian artist, and uh, he went back there to find that his forest was gone, so him and his wife decided to replant it, and they did that in, uh, well, they did that in so spectacular regenerative project. A lot of those um, birds, mammals, and reptiles are endangered. So this is now a nature reserve for endangered animals. Everything in the Brazilian Atlantic is endangered. Uh, when I was making the first website, um, I kept on trying to find animals to put good pictures of. Everything is endangered. It's all dying. It's, um, and it can be regenerated quite easily. So that's um, that's natural uh, regeneration. Um, just. Uh, reforestation. Agroforestry, I'm going to tell you briefly about. That there is a farm, it's a cow farm. The, the, the region used to be called, well, this, this farm, 502 hectares, hectare is about 38 um, tennis courts, put that into context. Um, that, so that was completely uh, deforested, completely uh, dry and abandoned. It hadn't rained for 10 years when I arrived. And you decided to replant it. And you replanted it with what they call syntropic agriculture. <laughs> syntropic is the opposite of entropic. It means tendency towards complexity. <laughs> and the way you do syntropic agriculture is by planting uh, a series of things. Kind of I'm going too fast here and just kind of wave your hand if it's getting confusing. But you plant a series of things, and normally they'll start with rocket, and that comes around land quickly. And then they'll put spinach in, and so it keeps, so it keeps the sun off the rocket, and they'll put in garlic, which keeps the bugs off everything else. And they'll put in bananas, because bananas are used, you can see there, to build up land mass, to build up soil when you're planting trees. And all these things have been planted together, nitrogen fixers, etc., etc., etc. Part of the reason, well, well, there's a load of reasons, but they're mimicking nature, and it also becomes massively abundant. So, a hectare of agroforestry, mature agroforestry, which matures quickly, eh, in about eight years, will produce 40 tonnes of food, right? Compare that to soy, monoculture soy will produce three tonnes, and one hectare of, um, one hectare of ranch land will produce one cow. Yeah, and while you're doing this, you're sequestering a massive amount of carbon and you're bringing back uh, river systems to life. So, in that place there, which used to be totally dry, there's now 14 streams running. It also started raining again. It hadn't rained for 10 years, but forest makes the earth cooler. Forest also produces particulate matter, which forms raindrops and it rains. So, the guy made it rain again, which is really cool. So, you know. I'd like to be a rainmaker. I mean, I've got these indigenous credentials here, but maybe you can help. So that's one way of doing it through um, agroforestry. The reason that Brazil is still practicing slash and burn agriculture, in fact, the reason that people are deforesting the Amazon, people in the Amazon come from Rio, most of them, uh, and they are people who can't make a living in Rio. Yeah, we tend to get this idea of these uh, evil people out there, deforesting the Amazon, they're trying to feed their kids and obviously. It's, uh, so when we talk about regeneration, we want to think about economic regeneration as well as ecological regeneration, social regeneration, and all of that stuff. Now, one of the things, of course, Brazil is in a catastrophic situation, but to be honest, Brazil was in a catastrophic situation before under Lula. Lula left office with an 86% uh, approval rating. Everyone loves Lula. He was in prison for a long time. During Alan Lula's uh, time, the Amazon deforestation went down. That was not because he stopped it, it was because it increased in Cerrado. He changed the laws of Brazil, which meant that Cerrado 
um, which is the biggest buyer in Brazil, could be exploited, and they lost half of it in eight years, right? A uh, million square kilometers uh, turned to soy farms in order to be exported for animal feed so we can eat hamburgers. That was it doing that. Um, so, uh, okay, cool. Um, all right, so where was I going with that? Yeah, um, from the indigenous perspective, I always had a meeting with the guys from the, uh, the Alpine crew who came over. There's an indigenous um, bunch who were traveling around Europe trying to encourage people not to burn the Amazon, nor not financing burning the Amazon. They said to me, none of these people would be for us, right? None of these people would be good. So, the funny thing about Bolsonaro is exactly the wrong way to go about this. What we want to be doing here is, is healthy uh, networks. So, regenerative agriculture is the impact network, right? We're a network which is trying to bring together these projects that you're seeing here. So how are we doing that? We're doing it by working with local communities, right? So we got invited, for example, the first thing you do is visit a bunch of conventional farmers to an agroforestry system to introduce them into different ways of doing stuff, uh, different ways of irrigating, different ways of, uh, you know, not, uh, no tillage, they call it, like leaving the stuff to rot where it lands, all that kind of stuff. The guy who drove the bus was the, um, the mayor of a town called Cachoeira. Cachoeira means waterfall, and the waterfall had dried up in the 1920s, and the mayor's dream is to see the waterfall flowing again. So he invited us to put a sapling nursery into the school, which we did uh, out of there. And um, that cost us about 600 quid, but that could produce about 1,000 trees per year, and those trees are going into, well, actually, so that place brought these, uh, that place Cachoeira. See, that was our first sapling nursery that we did in June. Uh, the people from, someone from the next door town said, oh that's interesting, can we do one in our school too? So we did one in their school too, uh, that was in Boa Vista. There's another eight schools in the region that have asked us to fund sapling nurseries there. We can't afford it without the money. Um, but if you give us money, that's what we're going to do with it. Um, so that's the first part, sapling nurseries. Why are we working, why are we working with schools? Well, we want to regenerate springs and hydrology. So first thing we need the trees, that's one thing. But also, dealing with landowners in Brazil is quite a, let's say, conservative demographic. And uh, trying, to, trying to encourage someone who's got five hectares to give up one hectare to regenerate a spring uh, is, is, a, is a big deal. But if you go to the kids, which is what we're doing, then the kids go to them and they start talking about hydrology. And it's your nephew, or it's your grandson, and they're talking about hydrology, and you're saying, oh yeah, my parents used to swim in that river that we've just, just deforested and destroyed. It. So this kind of pits the river has been quite successful. All of those, the next, the next one, um, there they are, look at them. That's our second sapling nursery, it's like third, and that's in this evening. That was a geodesic one, it was like a spaceship. Um, yeah, so these areas are all want we'll to recuperate in Cachoeira, and all of the landowners have given us access to their land now. Some of them are paying for the labour as well. They're going to watch these trees. So when you see these big tree planting uh, schemes, um, sometimes it's not very clear sometimes how well those trees are going to be monitored and managed once they're in the ground. So we're working with the community to do what they want to do to resist desertification and everything that comes with it uh, to improve the economic situation. Uh, and so on and so forth. So that's one way we're doing it. That's what happens when a cow treads on the land. So basically, what we need to do is just fence off uh, uh, sections of the land so we, uh, we can replant it and it can. When I say we, we're not actually doing anything, we're financing Brazilians to do it. Um, maximizing the impact. So we're also working as a sustainable teacher who produced that for us. We're producing teaching materials which can be understood by people who can't read. Uh, because kids are going to their parents talking about hydrology, they're also showing things like um, pollination, for example, which is a good way for good way for that conversation to happen. <laughs> so how do we work in partnership with local communities, developing and testing and replicating templates? I'm quite interested in uh, reforesting Cachoeira, but actually I'm really, really interested in reforesting, helping a wave of reforestation, which is already happening in Brazil. Uh, you get a lot of bad news in Brazil, there is a lot of bad news in Brazil, but there's also agroforestry. Uh, systems taking off. Um, I'll give you an example. A friend of mine, Daniel, I met Daniel when he was a recovery of crack addict um, in the Dari Centre. And having recovered from that, he then bought himself, uh, well, he didn't, he borrowed it in the first place, a disused sand quarry, half a hectare, and regenerated it, made an agroforest system there. And within two years, he was producing a veggie box, which he can now 
distribute to the people of uh, the city of Belarus. And he's also the head of a nucleus, an organization of 42 agriculturalists, all of them are um, conventional agriculturalists, small family farmers, and they've seen how abundant his sand quarry is, and they've started learning of him. So at the moment, he's accepting, he's basically accepting their labor in return for teaching them. But he's kids four, he's got three kids, and he has to take jobs painting houses. So we want to be able to pay him to do a more formal uh, course, five, uh, a five weekend course to teach everything you need to know about agriculture in order to convert from conventional farming to agriculture farming. Uh, it's much, much more abundant, as I've mentioned. It also employs more people. You can employ three people full time uh, in one hectare. It, and one hectare will support 40 families uh, as well. Super, super abundant. So these are the kind of things we're doing. Working with people who are already doing stuff in order to make them do it better and in order to find something to do with all this money that's kicking around uh, England. <laughs> um, bearing in mind that England is not rich off the misery of these people. Uh, like this, is, this is our British karma. In fact, the, the British used to take what they call a quinta. I all the gold using a space like the British crown, right? Uh, May, where are we? In the water, is that take just kings, right? May be built off the, off the money that's accrued in the trusts, which came from this particularly extractive uh, mission of Cruzel. So, uh, maybe it's time that we start to give something back. The last thing I want to say uh, is I want to show you a little video actually. Um, school partnerships. Let me show you this little video. This is by Sasha. If you know Sasha, he works with Beckley doing videos. The last is really cool. I got to call Pedro. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is my dream for the future. Um, yeah, so regarding money, um, we are selling these t shirts. These t shirts normally cost £25, my wife uh, pays them. Um, today they cost £30, and five of the five pounds will go to me. So if you want these, come find me. Thank you. Oh, yeah, and if there's any questions. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Danny. <laughs> so we've got an opportunity now to ask Danny some questions. Um, as moderator, I'm going to take my, my privilege by asking the first one, if you don't mind. You talked about this extraordinary encounter you had with the shaman uh, and, and the story of your healing. And you talk almost as if it's completely natural for you to be in the rainforest, or in the forest, running regenerative agriculture. I mean, it just seems now like a normal part of your life. But that was obviously a huge change from what you were doing before. How, and could you kind of tell us a little bit, of, I mean, was, was it a psychedelic experience that was part of that shift? Or, or was that, would that be an exaggerated, would that be giving an exaggerated importance? Do I answer for you? Can... If you press the button. I press the button. I so you take, take the mic. Uh, yeah, yeah, good question. Um, psychedelics, like the model of ayahuasca, that's what I'm really into. Um, ayahuasca, uh, you know, there's opportunities where it seems like there's dead ends, and that's one of the things it does. It makes us see potentials where, where before we would see something fixed. Um, uh, Walter Fisher uh, experiment talks about the unlearning of consistencies. This is going to sound like it's not talking about the same thing, but there's a, you know, the parallel lines test. You give someone, sit aside them, put some parallel lines on the screen in front of them, and you start moving them very slowly. And if someone, you ask someone to notice when parallel lines aren't, aren't parallel in the walk down the test, if they want to sit aside them, they spot it quicker. And uh, I think it's Fisher who did this experiment, talks about the unlearning of consistencies. Because you look at it and say, oh, it's, it's parallel. You look at it again, your brain says it's parallel, even if it isn't, unless you're taking psychedelics, in which case you can actually see some of those things that you reckon will really fix. And I guess in that sense, psychedelics have opened up an enormous amount of possibility, and not just the actual the taking of them, but also the magic around them, the particular magic around them. Uh, because, you know, people, people, are, people, are, people are absolutely crazy. To, 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 to try and treat the disease I have. Because the second stage of it attacks the cartilage in the nose and ears and stomach, etc. We'll put you in a car, we'll drive around with your brain and you see the people without noses. Take your injections, man, take your injections. I don't know if I've got a lot of injections. 
Um, okay, I went there very specifically to learn about diving and to finish writing this book, which is about medicine, magic, autonomy, and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, so to answer your question, yeah, Sunday is definitely one of the parts of my life which has opened up lots of possibilities. And if you look at the news, you would be forgiven for thinking we are, it's completely lost. There's, there's what do you do when the ice caps are melting? What do you do when there's, a, when there's a, a forest fire covering five time zones in Siberia, for example? Or when you get that not one drop of rain falling on the entire continent of Australia, which happened for the first time in history the other day. These things that like absolutely intractable problems, I think, from a psychedelic perspective. Maybe there's a bit of a bit of movement. And even if there's not, I've got to answer to angels at some point anyway, so I want to. Yeah, that's why I'm doing it. Yeah. That was your question. Yeah, we're getting there. <laughs> we'll come. We'll come back to that. We'll come back to that on the panel. Anyone else like to ask any question? Gentleman in the second row, Mike's coming to you. I love what you say, Danny, but I'm going to be rather pragmatic and just ask you about carbon sequestration um, because I'm very interested in using that as a mechanism for transfer of cash. And I wonder if you measure the amount of carbon you're sequestering in, in the course of your regenerative agriculture and um, the extent to which you think this could be used as a mechanism for injecting cash to persuade otherwise recalcitrant people to get in amongst it. But if I just project in here. Um, yeah, so I've done those kind of sums, uh, <coughs> yes, to work out how much carbon could be sequestered. I'm um, just trying to find them. Um, maybe that one will do. Uh, so working is it? I don't. That doesn't have to be entirely okay. scientific. It's a general um, answer. The phone. All right, fair enough. Um, that one. So yes, thank you for the question. Um, what we're doing uh, involves it is let's say the, the weight of it is more about responses to climate responses to climate change rather than actually sequestering. Sequestering. You can sequester a lot of carbon in an agroforestry system, don't get me wrong, particularly in the soil, I'm going to show you some figures, um, I can't come up with the figures right now, but I think it's like 43 tonnes per, uh, per hectare, if I'm not mistaken, right? Um, and uh, so in terms of, in terms of shifting from cow production to agroforestry, which is carbon, which is you know, it produces negative emissions rather than positive emissions. Yeah, it definitely has an impact on carbon sequestration. But the main thing we're interested in is how do communities respond to the reality of climate change, right? So in that region, just part of the marching, they're now experiencing the rain that you've met might experience experienced in the past in three months, they might get that in a day. Yeah, so what happens when that happens? Well, if you don't have any forest, it slides across the land, it leaches the plate, it knocks over your bridges, uh, what else does it do? Um, silts up the rivers, all that kind of stuff. Now, if you start planting strategically, and we're planting strategically along watercourses, for example, one of the things that does is slows that water, so it doesn't have those destructive effects. Uh, another thing that it does is it's resilient to, you know, as, as you saw one of the photos there, it makes it rain. Um, you can draw in rain like that. Um, there are other more, there do really want to be sequestering carbon in massive amounts to be producing seaweed plants, basically. Seaweed is the way to do that. I sort of study if you cover 11% of the oceans with seaweed, you'll kill between 8 billion people and uh, sequester all the carbon you could possibly, possibly require. So, yeah, there are more, more macros, for example. One in, in Hesifi, which is the third place we've got in the nursery, they're, they're looking at a restoration of. Um, uh, mangroves as well, which are highly, they also have sort of methane as well, um, so they're completely useful. So yeah, to answer your question, it does sequester a good amount of carbon compared to other, um, in, even natural forests, the afforestation is a really good one, but mainly we're looking at what impact it has at the local level. I think it's sort of fair to say that natural solutions to climate change are um, one part of the story, and unless we very, very rapidly stop the production of, of these things, which is a whole different story, uh, then it doesn't really matter how we produce it not. And that requires collective efforts, and I think it requires collective disobedience as well. Next question. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so what you, how, what's the, um, when, when speaking to people that you're working with in Brazil, how is the narrative of climate change spoken about? Because, I mean, you articulated against, um, I guess, the sort of the circumstances in which the people that you're working with have come through is very much through the kind of actions of colonial interests. So I think. If, I'd be interested to know how is that framed, because you can imagine there's quite a lot of anger, and so is there sort of a general sense that the change in what is coming day to day, is that is that tied into a narrative that this is sort of the outcome of 90 years of sort of un, unfettered sort of extraction, or does it feel as though it's, it, it doesn't really have a kind of scope? I'm just curious as you can kind of describe how they relate to, or what, how, how they relate to how they describe it. When I arrived uh, last December, I was in Brazil, desperate trying to get some ground, and I, I, I googled uh, agroforestry and minutes and Jigitona, uh, which is the part of Brazil where we started working. And only one person came up, and it turned out to be a guy called Danielle. And I know Danielle, because Danielle was a uh, doctoral student who came to the region, came to the region to study community psychology, particularly responses to climate change. So we've got someone on our gang whose whole study is that, right? I'm going to tell you a little story about that guy because it's really interesting. He arrived because uh, he, he went there because he was meant to be teaching um, poor rural people how to use science books, basically. And he arrived and he missed his uh, bus and so he had to walk in the halt in the heat and he got sunstroke and collapsed by the side of the road. And someone picked him up, put him on the back of his motorbike and took him to this woman who put a cloth on his head and a bottle on his head and drew out sunstroke by saying prayers over him. And he was like, what the hell is this? People got out sunstroke only takes about two days. It took about 10 minutes. Um, and, then the, and then the woman said, the reason you're bald is because your ex-girlfriend um, cast a spell on you and I'm going to take you to the woman who can make your hair grow back. And so they did, and someone said a prayer over his head, and his hair grew back. So then he decided to do, to do his PhD, two master studies on the local prayers and magics of the region, which is, which is where I met him, because my mother-in-law is one of these people who, you know, when, when, when my wife was ill, for example, her little brother or her cousin goes, I get to eat my life, you need to go and get three coals and see if they float in the water, and if they don't float, it's because you're eating life from a man. Anyway, and if they do, then you have to drink a coffee with these herbs in it, and she did, and got it. Anyway, she, so this is like, kind of, uh, so for this guy, I'm telling you about him, which is quite funny, um, but he got really fascinated by the room, by the region. he learned how to do these prayers. So his, his, his area of study is community responses to it. They're very local, the way people see it is very local, right? They don't have a narrative of climate change. Um, they, you know, Brazilian population has been, I think, deliberately dumped down by the post dictatorship government, um, they don't get schooled particularly well. Uh, but they do understand very clearly the connection between, let's say, deforestation and local climactic changes. I mean, they're seeing the, the dry periods getting longer every, every year, literally every year, uh, a couple of days longer every year. So they're very aware of those kind of local things. Um, my business partner, Michael Thomas, he is meeting with the MST, uh, which is the biggest social movement in the world, actually, it's got 500 uh, sorry, uh, half a million families, uh, biggest producers of organic food in Brazil. Bolsonaro wants to put them on the terrorist list at the moment. Um, but they had no idea about it. I mean, really, the, the narrative of climate change is there. You know, when Lula came out of prison, you know, they were in the middle of a month of catastrophic oil spill, the worst disaster in Brazilian history, and Lula was coming out, and all the books destroyed the big fascists, and workers, 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 and he's back into the old Marxist narrative. Uh, and this is, the, this is the thing that people kind of got to. It was a bit like strong men yeah. uh, to, to lead them. So we're trying to do some grassroots, and that involves kind of different psychology, and it's much more level of psychology. What does, what does climate change, or what weather patterns change you need to do in this area, in, in this time? So does that answer your question there? Yeah, so I guess the sense of like, they, they, they see that the local change, this sort of dramatic change over a short period of time, that felt, feels very much as opposed to being tapped into a kind of global change. They see it as being pretty sort of, it sort of stays global. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean it is about, I mean, on, on a very 
it is very much as though we're going to climate change setting part of it, but they've got eucalyptus um, plantations there, which are called green deserts, because nothing lives in eucalyptus. It grows four times as fast as any local tree, and it draws the water table and wells run out, right? So they know, they know what's happening, because they know that when the eucalyptus arrives, the, the wells run out, yeah. But I mean, just to give you an impression of how local, the, the way people think in, in, in there, for example, what about Wefra? She thought where the sunset would be in the world, right? Um, I met a guy in, in, in uh, Rio Branco, which is a big town. Um, he was a motor taxi guy. And he said, Oh, whereabouts in America? He thought, I went, I'm not from America, I'm from England. He said, Oh, where's England? I went, That's it's in Europe. Where's Europe? Mm-hmm. Near Portugal is where Portugal is, where your language comes from. Oh, where's Portugal? But the best you go from here, you got to buy here, that. You cross over, or cross over the water, you get Europe. Oh, I didn't know that. You know, it's, it, it's not the world that's kind of in that image of the current country. It's not really how it was, the rural Brazilians don't think like that. When me and my girlfriend at the time went to uh, Peru, there was an earthquake in China, and her dad was worried that we'd been affected by the earthquake in China. So yeah, it's, 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 it's a way of the world. Um, having said that, this climatologist is now advising the MST, he's advising uh, some, some government people in, uh, in Brazil. So at a kind of policy level, there's a bit more understanding. So for example, when the MST, or when the indigenous nation gets expelled from their land, even when they want to move here, he's going to say, well, that's probably going to be un- uninhabitable in 10 years, we're going to go somewhere else. I'm really glad that sound was made. Thanks so much for your work and story for me. Um, I have another question around kind of the human elements. And I'm just saying that the landowners get convinced by the children who speak of the BPE, and so they kind of hand over their land <coughs> these projects. Um, <coughs> is that, what does it take to convince them? Like, is it the child's like, passion, or is it that they also then find out about the economic story? So the question is sort of like, what has to shift for this to become, you know, to really kind of explode and become a hugely funded wonderful mm-hmm. Okay. <coughs> yeah, so one of the other things about Brazilians, um, a lot of Brazilians, especially rural Brazilians, is they've been quite struggling to survive quite a long time. And when you're struggling to survive, you tend to do what you did last year because it kept you alive last year. So if, if it was such a burden last year, you'll do it again this year, and you know, you'll get about six, seven years to cross out your land, and then you're just going to do it again. Um, as, a, as a gringo rocking up, I'll tell you actually, so I was looking the Leza, which is a tiny community, a arts community, uh, up in, on the Bolivian border. And um, so I, I, that's where I met my, my missus, and that's uh, kind of where I cured, cured my disease as well. And a friend of mine who works for Lush Cosmetics, they were trying to buy bits of the Amazon. They bought 4,000 acres in Peru for rosemary extraction, for example. And she said, Do you know anywhere in Brazil which might be something? So I sent this woman, this Brazilian woman, and sent her up to the jungle. And she kind of went there and said, Here, this is what you do, you do this, you do this, you do this. And they went, Well, we're kind of thinking about you know, setting up a pig farm and uh, increasing the acres around uh, if you present an idea to Brazilians who are on kind of survival level, or certainly survival mentality, they will just think you're a crazy gringo. And she's not a gringo, she's a Brazilian woman, and a successful businesswoman. Um, so what would it take to uh, affect though, that cognitive change? Demonstrative centres, as simple as that. If you're going to school and you're picking up your kid, and your kid has had lunch, much more varied lunch than you've had, because you're a professional farmer, and they've got an agricultural system in their school, then that's a way of us uh, getting access to their parents. And you're also going to be putting on these free, um, uh, these free conversion courses in the various places that are active as well. So yeah, basically demonstration is the answer to that question. Hi, um, I'm wondering about the kind of horror stories that you hear about kind of big corporations like buying out, buying out landowners and stuff like that, and the kind of the the threats against climate activists, you know, that are in South America. And I just wanted to talk a little bit more about that. 
What corporations do you say? Just like in general. Like, yeah, corporations. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, Brazil has now surpassed Colombia in terms of the most dangerous place to be an activist. Um, um, one of the reasons we're not active in the. We're not, if we get active in the Amazon, it's going to be around Rio Branco, um, the part of where I was began that story. If you work in the Amazon, like for example, I've got a friend who bought 11 hectares in the Peruvian Amazon. Uh, set up a climate center, uh, set up a Chinese medicine school, start teaching English, all that stuff. Three, it was a Shipiba, Shipiba area, three of the tech has already been burned down, right? Um, it's very, very difficult to monitor what's going on in the Amazon, right? There are indigenous Albertans, uh, including the Pobo um, Awa, the word of indigenous nation, I'm not an indigenous nation, which was probably genocided by the Star Shadow Fires. The firefighters going in were stopped by heavily armed uh, loggers. And so this nation is, it looks like they've been snuck out. Um, I could give you horror stories all day. Um, I try not to watch that news anymore. I'm focusing on other stuff. I'm focusing on what I can do to try and keep myself sane. Um, but yeah, it's dangerous. It's, it's a dangerous place to be. It's not so dangerous as a gringo. Uh, so you get a certain amount of um, protection because they don't want to cause an international incident. By, uh, you know, so I, I personally don't think any particular danger. Um, I mean, I'm almost, you know, I've already dealt with the parasites of the region. Um, the reason, so we're not really active in a, so much in the deeper Amazon, and people have asked us, like, talk about what's going on with the we I'd like to buy a chunk of the Amazon. Uh, Norway tried to buy a chunk of the Amazon, what is it, 300 million, they put it there. Uh, they've now decided that that's untenable. Because what do you do? I mean, Bolsonaro is now saying the board is going to extract metal. And uh, the question is how do you defend it? So we're all looking where civilization already is to try and uh, change the way that people approach their local environments. We don't need to be extending that frontier of destruction further. Not take any actual medication, and like, how did you get your? Um, I took anti medication. I took uh, a leaf of a uh, mango, I took the leaf of a cashew, uh, I took bark of a mula pera. Um, I, I, I did a lemon fast where I, you bet it's easy one, you get up in the morning, you drink the juice of one lemon, you don't eat for three, for three hours, and then you avoid fats and uh, sugar and salt during the day. Second day, two lemons, third day, three lemons, fourth day, four lemons, all up to ten lemons, and you start going back down to zero, nine, eight, seven, and then again, cycle two, go up to twenty, uh, and then that back down to zero, nineteen day fast, both times. Yeah, that was a pretty good occasion. Uh, I was drinking loads of ayahuasca, I was drinking ayahuasca every day at four o'clock in the morning for uh, about four or five months of that. Um, and I was isolated as well, and part of my treatments, let's say, well, actually, this happened. I got this, uh, I got the thing, I started showing people, they said, hey, look at mine, this is my side, this is my side. You're going to lose your nose, you're going to lose your nose, you're going to lose your nose, man. You're agreeing with me, I don't know what you're doing, you're going to lose your nose. My, my academic background is history and philosophy of science, technology, medicine, and I've seen this story many times, many times, and I just don't buy it. I just simply don't buy it. Um, so, what did I do? I treated it. Um, I treated it like that, you know, uh, I made a decision, I went to Curandero and I said, I want to um, treat this disease with uh, with Dunning. And he said to me, I can't treat that with Dunning, you need to go to the hospital. And I said, well, I'm here to learn about Dunning, and that's what I'll do. He said, well, you can't. I said, well, I heard your father was great, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that got on the side, so I thought, we'll do it. And so, so he, he gave me instructions, his instructions were in, he actually signed a song to me. Which goes, uh, uh, um, always follow me or run me. He put his hand up, he said, You're going to treat this, he treated me, yeah, and I'll treat this one, I said, Yeah, I'll treat you. And he put his hand up in it. And he sung this line, which means, um, Always follow your road and let other people talk, as in, and listen to what they're saying. Right? And that was really important, because when anyone, when anyone talked to me in that community, they would say to me, Have you had your attention yet? How is your illness? I didn't want to be thinking about my illness all the time. I was thinking about it. I had to clean it four times a day with these various teas and stuff. It would swell up into a kind of boil uh, with pus running out of it. And then I'd put a, 
a mud pack with various herbs and ayahuasca in it. Uh, and then in the morning, I'd put it on night, it would dry out, in the morning it would go out the wood again. So that was my cycle. And every time I did it, I could see it was bigger or smaller, and it had to meaning all the way through. Yeah. So that's how I treated it. I treated it with loads of medicine, there just wasn't antimony and tartrate. Right? My other option was antimony and this is what happened, right? Uh, everyone said you need to take injections of antimony and tartrate. Right? Three a day, into your veins, maybe 150, maybe 180, maybe 250. Depends on how long it is. If you leave it another three days, it's definitely going to be 250. Um, antimony and tartrate right? is heavy metal, it attacks the carnage in your uh, elbows and stuff, all your joints. I, I, I listened to that, that instruction, I went and drank those behind me, and I sat there and I concentrated. And what I saw was I saw um, all of these people who had been telling me to take my medicine, to take my injections. I saw what else was wrong with them. Some had, one of them had a weird bump to his legs, and one of them had joint trouble, and one of them was just an ignorant idiot who didn't learn what he was be learning. And then I started thinking about the, um, the various different, uh, you know, like I said, I wrote a book on this, so I've talked quite a lot about what medicine means. And, this is the only culture where significance is generated by whereabouts on a graph, something called like mathematical statistical significance. And I'm not down with it. I think that ooh, um, I think that significance, cure, crisis, and cure are significant things. So, for example, when 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 the world got bigger because I had um, broken my DS or something like that, that was meaningful. Right. So how does I treat it? Um, I treat it by not listening to other people, having decided what I'm going to do, and drinking loads and loads of ayahuasca. I only really care about something. I don't recommend that you go off and, uh, if you have a medical problem, that you drink, take some psychedelics, and then that's not necessarily, I'm not saying that's necessarily the right answer, but I've already been in that tradition for seven, eight years by this point, and I've learned quite, I've been drinking a lot of ayahuasca, and it's, it's, it's every two weeks for years. Uh, and in big sessions. Um, so you need to learn your way into these plants a little bit before you do the donation thing, I would say. So if you end up in the hospital because you've done something funny, because that's it, I'm going to make it funny. Thank you. the question of perhaps a parallel between your own healing crisis and maybe what we can draw from that on a, on a higher level, even on a planetary level. And I was so struck by that when you, when you showed that forest and how it regenerated. And it, it, you were obviously so moved by it, partly because of your own, your own healing. I guess I come back to the final question is what do you bring back? You know, yeah. a lot of people with, on psychedelics and on their various workshops and stuff, they may be having wonderful experiences. But at some point, yeah, but at some point, what those experiences are actually doing, what those experiences are actually doing. I want to say a special thank you to Sam for being late. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll hand over once more to Dr. Sam Gandhi, who started off as an ecologist with a PhD from the University of Aberdeen, um, moved on to work as a scientific assistant to the Beckley Foundation which has done extraordinary work to increase public understanding of psychedelics. Now working as a collaborator with the uh, Psychedelic Research Group at Imperial College London. Uh, and he's going to talk about his research on psychedelic science and what it tells us about how these medicines can increase nature connectedness, moving from egoism to ecoism. Thank you very much, Sam Gandhi. Um, it is one thing to reinvent the sick, the sick mass extinction event of, of life on planet Earth. And unlike all previous events, this has been orchestrated by single species, uh, by human beings. At the, uh, the culmination of the uh, intergovernmental science policy platform, on uh, Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. So this is a report, um, the most comprehensive assessment of its kind ever undertaken. Uh, I think 100, 145 world experts from 50 different countries looking back at 50 years worth of data. Looking at uh, our ecological 
environmental situation on, on planet Earth. And the conclusion of this report was, was pretty dire in terms of the rates of species loss of global ecosystem degradation and destruction is unprecedented and accelerated. And without full scale global ecological mobilization on the scale of World War II, uh, we are headed for deep trouble. So, something I want to, you to think about when I'm, when I'm talking, when I'm going through this talk is um, we have the scientific knowledge, we have the intellectual understanding of what we're doing to the planet. And we have the clear, cold knowledge and understanding of that. It's very, very clear. And yet, it is not sufficient to motivate uh, societal change at the scale or speed it needs to to make a difference. So, what is it going to take to, to change things? So, this is a, a quote from environmental world of us, and I don't want to sort of in any way get all leery in, in my vibe, but he's saying, you know, we kind of we need a cultural and spiritual transformation, and we scientists don't know how to do that. Now, I think actually our scientists are maybe uh, not completely clueless about when it comes to potential tools that can facilitate just such a cultural and spiritual transformation as I kind of hope to get across in the, this talk. So, and something else to sort of bear in mind in terms of what was going on with the planet, our current our current system, our current economic system, is it's the, the, the aim, the ultimate aim is infinite perpetual growth on a planet of finite resources. This is the same um, operating mode that membership a cancer cell uh, operates. It's not a viable long-term chain plan. So yeah, this is an interesting perspective from uh, the deep ecologists and thinkers. So ecology and spirituality are fundamentally connected because deep ecological awareness ultimately is spiritual awareness. So our society is, you know, fundamentally kind of materialistic, reductionist, and increasingly so atheistic, and you know, spirituality in scientific circles is a sort of fairly dodgy term to be uh, parading around. And so, but perhaps there is something here, perhaps we have kind of lost uh, something. Now that's maybe part of, the, part of the reason we're in the mess that we're in now. So, as well as ecological destruction, um, we have a as well as the ecological crisis, we have a mental health crisis as well. And this is, uh, this seems to stem largely from um, <coughs> like disconnection. Disconnection in kind of a broad sense. So disconnection from core self and disconnection from other human beings. And uh, this, this has major, major health uh, issues. Uh, health implications. So loneliness uh, resulting from the, uh, the breakdown of communities and its disconnection is considered to be a major uh, health issue. So on par with uh, obesity and greater, greater than smoking. And the World Health Organization considers depression to be the number one cause of disability worldwide, affecting over 300 million people um, a year. So something's kind of weird there. I would like some of those. <laughs> I should have done it. It's <laughs> This kind of disconnection has implications on you know, economics, uh, social, kind of sociology, um, and psychology. 
And it seems as well that uh, this, this disconnection is playing out in the political sphere as well. Uh, so this individual disconnection is playing out on the level of society. And we're seeing this increased sort of polarization, tribalism, and us and them uh, divisive politics and it seems to be seems to be growing uh, when really we, we kind of need to sort of be going the other way. So I kind of get to. So at least while with regard to kind of ecological nature disconnect, there seems to be a few different things that have sort of happened sequentially. The first sort of the first thing was was farming, was our domestication of uh, plants and animals, and certainly it's so the seeds of our civilization today, and there's no doubt about that. But it was our first step away from, from nature, when we stopped being hunter gatherers and became farmers. We prioritised the existence of certain species of life forms over the existence of others. And so that fundamentally changed how we view nature and interacted with it. As a result of our domestication of plants and animals, we started living in cities. And more and more humans together, division of, of labour, and in a way of these things, culture, uh, religion, the arts, we have more time and we have some more people doing different things. And this is what we increasing cities and urbanisation. So again, further disconnect from nature. The most recent, and perhaps the sort of most profound uh, disconnecting agent seems to be linked to the increasing dependency on technology that we have in our lives. So particularly since the 1950s, there's been a shift um, away in terms of cultural like films and a few interesting studies of new films and how they're much less nature reference now and much more technically referencing man-made objects. It's kind of a, it's an indicator of our shift away um, from nature. So yeah, it's kind of an issue of like the more we, the more we watch, the less we see uh, of the world around us. So just to zoom out for a second, uh, when astronauts view the Earth from space, it tends to have a profound cognitive shift upon them, and this sort of stays with them uh, for the rest of their days, and this is what calls the overview effect. So, truly transformative experiences involving senses of wonder and awe, unity with nature, transcendence, and universal brotherhood. So, interestingly, these are all sort of fundamental components of the mystical type of experiences that psychedelics can uh, catalyze. Obviously, unfortunately, not all of us are going to be able to travel space and um, you know, experience the only effect for ourselves, so perhaps psychedelics are a good sort of potential option. <laughs> so, an important mediator of these experiences, so one of the only effect of psychedelic uh, experiences, or out-of-body experiences, and a number of very powerful experiences humans can undergo, or seems to be an important mediator. And this is also, yeah, being linked to, uh, to psychedelics. So, or is essentially the feeling of being very small in relation to something very much bigger than you. And this has important uh, effects, after effects, on human beings. It makes us more Social, it increases our well-being. Another sort of useful concept is that of uh, E.O. Wilson's uh, biophilia. So the connections that human beings subconsciously seek with the rest of life, and this sort of follows on from you know the fact that we we've been living in natural environments for about 99.99% of our species. Existence, um, so we're kind of like we're physiologically, psychologically wired to thrive in these environments and to have nature around us. So one of the interesting uh, and few, one of the few positive uh, aspects of that report uh, that I started with was areas under the control or management of the indigenous people some of the only areas in the world not undergoing uh, ecological degradation. 
In fact, there was a recent paper published this year that found in some cases, areas inhabited by indigenous people can be actually more biodiverse and more rich than protected areas with no humans. Um, an interesting sort of, an interesting aspect to different indigenous groups living across the world is they have a different sort of concept of, of how they exist in terms of nature and community. So they have a much, they tend to have a less individualistic, egoic existence to us here in the West. They're much more kind of community referenced and embedded. And they also have this very deep um, connection to nature. And it seems once your, once your connection to nature um, sort of goes up past a certain point, you essentially view your, the environment you inhabit as an extension of yourself. So why would you harm yourself? Why would you harm your surrounding environment? Unfortunately, one of the side effects of our very successful materialistic technological civilization is that we've severed, uh, we've severed that into nature and, and the interiors of knowledge uh, that, that stems from it. Notably, too, uh, quite a few of these psychedelic groups use psychedelic substances um, as well. So, but that's sort of, that's not a fundamental part of their practices at all. But it's something I will come back to. So, just to look at some of the sort of effects that nature um, can have. So, an interesting study finding that simply. Acknowledging nature around us can increase our connection, connectedness on a broad scale. So beyond just connecting to nature, it can actually facilitate our connection to people uh, and life as a whole. So nature connection uh, or nature relatedness, which is a way which is simply our self-identification with nature, the degree to which we identify with being part of nature. Uh, there's, a, there's a substantial body of research literature uh, to show it has important effects on psychological health and well-being. So, lower anxiety, um, increased positive effect, life satisfaction and meaning, and enhanced psychological functioning at the state and trade level. It's also an important mediator of some of the benefits one obtains from actually spending time in nature as well. So it's an important mediator of positive effects or the propensity to experience positive emotions. Um, it also, one's nature relatedness or connection, um, also tends to increase intrinsic aspirations over extrinsic. Aspirations. So intrinsic aspirations are things like personal development, um, community, intimacy. Uh, extrinsic aspirations are material things, the pursuit of material things, money, power, things like that. So another very important aspect of nature connection is uh, it's a strong predictor of programming for behaviour. Uh, and attitudes. And in fact, uh, according to some of the research, it may be the, the single strongest uh, predictor of environmental, pro-environmental behaviour. So, coming back again to this theme of, of disconnection um, and how it relates to psychedelics. So, um, yeah, my good friend Dr. Ross Watts did some, some interesting and valuable qualitative research on psilocybin as part of the Imperial Depression trials. And one of the interesting aspects uh, to people's depression that was revealed through these qualitative surveys was this reoccurring theme of disconnection. Everyone who was depressed independently said they felt disconnected. And the psilocybin works, in part at least, not the full story, but in part by facilitating connection. Again, in a broad sense, so reconnecting to one's core self, reconnecting to other people, and to the world at large. And it's interesting to know that when people were depressed, um, it was only they only kind of realised they'd been missing a connection to nature 
focus experience when their depression sort of sort of dropped a bit, so the nature came into focus and they realised what they they missed. So just just to quickly sort of yeah discuss the potential mechanisms of what's going on here uh, in terms of psychedelics uh, facilitating this this state of uh, interconnection and unity with, with the world and nature. And it seems to largely hint are hinged on experiences of ego distribution. So under a large dose of psychedelic, say 25 milligrams of psilocybin, um, Wyan's default moral network, which is thought to be kind of a fundamental neuro, neural component of the sense of self, becomes to become relaxed and will start to dissolve and break down. And when this happens, it's sort of the boundaries, the perceived boundaries between the self and other break down and kind of, kind of facilitate this kind of expanded uh, state or, or self nature over. And the memory of that um, is a very powerful, vivid memory that seems to really stay in people and they can kind of then draw on it in the cold, sober life day moving forward. So, yeah, I thought this is an account of one of the participants in the suicide and depression research. She thought it was interesting, so I thought I'd be on earth, and I zoomed out. From weeks afterwards, I was absolutely connected to myself, to every living thing, to the universe. This connection is just a lovely feeling, this sense of connectedness, we are all interconnected. So, again, this kind of also hints about this potential um, egalitarian psychedelic route to something resembling. The overview effect. <coughs> so this is um, some, some early sort of eco data, survey data, um, sort of yeah, conducted by our very own David Luke. And um, so David sort of, yeah surveyed uh, various different people on their sort of nature connection and psychedelic use. So interestingly, for everyone, everyone actually wanted to complete the survey, all of them. <laughs> 100% reported an increased connection to nature as a result of their psychedelic experiences. Um, all of these, um, uh, yeah, psilocybin mushrooms definitely seem kind of top of the pile. I mean, this might affect just total overall usage relative to the other substances there. They seem to be top of the pile. Uh, I've kind of already made the joke before about ketamine use was, you know, mushroom in the ecological age of the various So, so psilocybin has been found to um, increase one's sort of connection to the environment and nature relatedness uh, in the long term in both clinical and healthy populations. So one paper kind of pulled together study data from eight different, different individual studies and it found that up to 18 months later, people's, a third of people's relationship to the environment had been sort of markedly uh, enhanced and deepened. And this is interesting because uh, these environments people were taking psilocybin were about as sterile as you could get. Some of them were in a pet, uh, pet brain scan, which they said was not a particularly nice, nice place to be under the influence of psilocybin. And yet, in spite of that, people's, fundamental, people's relationship to nature and environment was fundamentally changed. So it kind of caused the depression. I wonder what would happen in these days to the sign of people actually in Asia. Um, Rick Dobby did an interesting follow-up of the Marsh Chapel experiment subjects. So this is divinity students who were at Harvard who were given a large dose of psilocybin or placebo. And he followed them up a quarter of a century later and asked how that singular experience had changed their life. And I think he interviewed all but all but one or two of them. And one of the reoccurring things that came up with him was his deepened appreciation and connection to, to life and to, and to nature. Even a quarter century later, that experience still inspired and informed people. So another interesting long-term shift that psilocybin can catalyze is this increase in openness, personality domain openness. So my other the other personality traits, this, this particular one is associated with certain cognitive abilities and also cognitive reserves as well. 
to the team as we age. Uh, well, it was thought prior to this initial research by the, the Hopkins team that the personality is essentially fixed by the age of 30 and it's going to take something pretty big, like an end of experience, to kind of shift your personality in a deep way. Uh, but it seemed from this research that no, we can actually increase openness. And that openness is sort of associated with things like hunger for knowledge, appreciation for its aesthetics and new experiences, and appreciation for other people's views and viewpoints. And one of the other things that I hope that strongly correlates with is nature connection and programmatic awareness. So, yes, ayahuasca has been found to increase levels of self transcendence, and that can kind of be considered analogous to openness in the psilocybin studies. And yes, sexual research not involving ayahuasca has found that. Um, yeah, this self transcendence is a, is a powerful predictor of nature laziness and environmental concern. So, this is a bit of a worthy sign, but it's just paying homage to it. It's a really important study um, by a guy, Mateus Forsman, who's at Yale. And yeah, these guys, they looked at um, it was a survey, so it's a, a lot of the data that's been research that's been done is, is correlative data. Uh, correlative research. But this is quite interesting in that it looked at other substances and it found that definitely this is a unique uh, capacity of psychedelics. Other substances do not have this sort of uh, effect. And they also took into account personality traits, so kind of like eliminating the potential effect of openness that I just mentioned. And they had a good sort of uh, sample size and they found that, yeah, this lifetime experience, total lifetime experience with classical psychedelics um, increased by environmental behaviour, and it's particularly through this nature laziness, through this self-identification with nature. As one's connection to nature goes up, um, it seems one concerned us as a sign of that. And this is a much stronger effect than, say, knowledge of nature. I mean, having a, an academic understanding of what different things in nature are is a much weaker predictor of one's concern for nature. So, and that's an interesting case uh, in point in terms of the big difference between having a scientific objective understanding of something and having a direct experiential comprehension of something. They're two very different ways of obtaining knowledge about the world around us. So this is some of the data from that I used to be working on with uh, colleagues from, from the Central Psychedelic Research at Imperial. And yeah, this is a, um, so nature relatedness is uh, on the left there, and it's total lifetime experiences with the classical psychedelics. You found a very, very strong relationship indeed between total consumption of classical psychedelics and nature laziness. And this nature laziness source, as has been kind of shown by studies, are also strongly correlated with overall well-being scores as well. <coughs> so I can't say too much about this research right now because we just submitted a paper on it and it's currently unpublished. But um, it did seem we also looked at ego dissolution experiences and access to natural environments and as may be expected both of these were positive contributors to, to enhance nature readiness. And this is just an example of some of the ways people might actually experience being part of nature um, through their experiences. So before I enjoy nature, now I feel part of it. Before I was looking at it as a thing, like a TV or a painting, you were part of it. There's no separation or distinction. You are it. I felt like sunshine jumping through leaves. I was nature. So it seems this kind of deep ecological connection and the concern that stems from it is a a fundamental part of a, of a sort of fairly universal human experience. So this is something that's also uh, quite commonly reported with people who experience near-death experiences when they come back 
they tend to have a deep uh, love for and connection to nature and will sort of reorganize their life so it's a more central part. So, yeah, another sort of aspect of all this that we looked at is, uh, yeah, is, is active, is sort of active, environmental activism. So, yeah, um, I can't look these sort of slides all the way around, really, but let's just skip to this one first. So, yeah, in the 60s, the environmental movement really sort of blossomed, and, uh, as well as the civil rights movement, the anti Vietnam War movement, and it seems like that wasn't a coincidence. The US president at the time, Richard Nixon, felt very strongly that psychedelics like LSD were effectively making hippies. So to criminalise it and take away their stash, it would sort of stem the hippie flow, uh, yeah, the source. And so some of the research uh, that's being done now suggests that like, psychedelics do facilitate ecological concern. And they also, oops, Wrong way. Um, they can also facilitate this increase, uh, sort of decrease authoritarian uh, political views as well, which is interesting. And that seems also to correlate to openness. Uh, there can be a real sense of authority that comes through the, the mystical experience that psychedelics can catalyze, and it seems that can be quite threatening to existing hierarchical power structures. And I think it's testament to. Uh, here in the UK, psychedelics are scheduled on substances, so, you know, uh, substances with a much greater harm profile, more limited medical utility, and addiction potential like methamphetamine, like heroin and cocaine, are all scheduled too, and they're much more accessible to researchers and doctors who wish to work with them. So I think the extreme classification made for psychedelics is a cultural hangover of fear by the authorities from what happened in the 60s. And this study is also important. It looked at a sub-sample of the depression, suicide and depression uh, participants. It's the first clear prospective research showing a causative before and after uh, increase of nature-relatedness uh, in people. And yeah, this was evident still strongly at, at 12 months later post-dosing. So this isn't some fleeting thing, it seems to be a powerful and enduring shift in people. So this is kind of a little bit of an extrapolation, but I think we can kind of infer from this. So this so this is research suggesting that when a population of a nation say rises up in peaceful peaceful process, uh, once they sort of go over the 3.5% total population mark, it will topple any government. And much more effectively than, than an armed uh, revolution or, or otherwise, if it tends to gain a lot more sympathy from uh, other, men, other people in the country. So, and obviously that's sort of a little bit of, of a divergent thing from what I'm talking about. But the point I want to get across here is I don't think that. Psychedelics are likely to ever be a majority game. You know, they're just not, they're not everyone's cup of tea. And but the thing is, they don't need to be a majority pursuit uh, to have transformative effects on the whole of society. So, this is a, a quote from a, uh, a gathering of eco psychologists uh, from about 30 years ago. So I think it kind of highlights quite well how psychedelics uh, and our connection to nature can kind of increase this uh, desire, this intuitive knowledge that indigenous groups do. That if the soul is expanding to become the natural world, behaviour leading to the destruction of the world will be experienced as self destruction. And this was very much um, echoed by the great. Uh, chemist Albert Hoffman, um, looking back at sort of at the end of his life, at the age of 101, um, he came to feel that uh, the capacity of LSD and other psychedelics to connect us to, to nature is perhaps its single most important 
and fundamental property. I know from a reliable source that Albert took great joy in hearing about cases of people who lived in the city who reconnected and found nature through their LSD experiences. And he said, alienation from nature and the loss of the experience have been part of the limitations, the greatest tragedy of our materialistic era. It is the positive reason for ecological devastation and climate change. Therefore, I attribute absolute highest importance to consciousness change. I regard psychedelics as catalyzers of this. So, psychedelic therapy on its own, um, in a medicalized context, is, is not going to be sufficient to bring about broad scale societal change. Uh, that we need. So this is me practicing um, alternative approach brought up by this, this guy Bennett Zellner and he proposes um, that essentially psychedelic use and treatment sites should be should act to sort of um, imbue the local community or be embedded in the local community. So if psychedelics acting as therapy and reconnecting agents, they're playing a role in reconnecting people to, uh, to a community context rather than being sort of divorced of that. Uh, so it's a slightly holistic, zoomed out, bigger picture look. And so notably, um, this pollinator model, which is, I guess, yeah, it's taking clear reference from ecological systems uh, rather than our current highly sustainable economic and political systems. Um, it also goes on to say that um, this approach is incompatible with for-profit pharmaceutical companies producing psilocybin. So for this to be viable, non-profit uh, companies, of which there are some, um, are the ones to go with and for. So, yeah, looking, looking ahead, the, the United Nations, is, <coughs> so the next decade ahead of us will be the decade of ecosystem restoration. So, our, our current political economic system, as I mentioned, is very, very much out of alignment with a long-term, viable, sustainable ecological future. And we need to urgently transition into an ecological Civilization with values based on uh, very much criminalizing eco side, long term sustainability, but like actively playing an active role in instilling a regenerative, restorative culture and like civilization. So we kind of stand on a, on a bit of a precipice in terms of where we are now, we're either headed for rain down or break through. If this sort of, if the division and the disconnection win out, we will ultimately likely fragment into smaller communities and, and groups. And this is, this would be very dire given the scale of global problems that we face. Like the arm of, of human civilizations, civilization has been a movement towards ever greater, more coherent community and connectedness, in a sense. From tribes, to chiefdoms, to kingdoms, to nation states, to a global civilization, and to the taking of the uh, Earth rights photograph 50 years ago. Um, so, if it's a sort of a different path to break down, we would break through. And that would see our civilization jump to a much greater level of coherence and interconnection. And that would hopefully allow us to face these, these global challenges and problems we need to face as a species. But the ultimate deciding factor will dictate which one of these wins out is ultimately psychological and a degree to which we feel threatened or connected or divided 
for have you seen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, so much of the work that comes from, I think you're given that opportunity to have an experience, um, but it's very much about what's done with it. And so I think a lot of these ideas you know, do give us that insight, but it's very much about what do you do with it afterwards. Um, and people like Ross has, has done huge amounts of work on integration afterwards and knows, and knows, I think, better than I do how important that is. And so again, for me, I think we have to look back as well to the history of psychedelics. This is the second, or I think the third, as some people talk about, the third sort of coming of psychedelics. The second within the West. But the first time it came about, there was a huge amount of conflict and existential concern in the 60s. And so from my point of view, the interest in psychedelics can seen, seen in another way as a sort of canary in a coal mine, that we're sort of looking for an answer, we're looking to how to connect. Um, so I think for me that's quite a, it's, a, it's important to be understood about why are we now interested in psychedelics, why is it taking 50, 60 years, in some sense maybe we're being given an opportunity to think about what's important. Catherine, I, I'd like to bring you in at this point. You, you, you sort of, you, you sit in the world of futuristic technology, glimpses of what civilization could look like if we managed to, to hold it together long enough. But at the same time, you're, you're researching ritual yeah. and, and the meaning of that. And, and I wonder if there's a connection between that and the kind of integration and, and, and somehow finding a way to make sense of these incredible experiences that these medicines can overcome. I mean, absolutely. So I, I, I came to um, the psychedelic sort of research uh, from a completely different angle. And I'm not the only person who sits very much outside it but sees it as my ally. So a lot of my work was about sort of the future, um, but it was mainly about collective intelligence because things like climate change are a sort of multidisciplinary, very complex problem that needs a sort of collective intelligence. So we're at this point in humanity where we can use technology to leverage collective intelligence. Now the study that I'm doing with the Imperial Interaction Foundry is about modern day rituals, how we've lost them, how we could create them. And the reason being uh, we're working with Nesta on a collective intelligence playbook and one of the biggest problems with collective intelligence or the things that can actually diminish it working is lack of connection with each other, uh, lack of openness and ego. And where I came across all the psychedelic research was of course it actually leverages this, you know, it makes us more connected, it makes us more open, it makes better for learning and it dissolves ego. So that was my sort of intro to it all, is the amazing ability it has. So we started looking at these isolated research groups who were looking at everything from people at experimental psychology in UCL, who were looking at the overview effect and social connectedness, uh, to people uh, also at UCL looking at the microbiome and how being in nature changes that, and the possibility that perhaps things like psychedelics can change that and actually change Sorry, what's the, what's the microbiome? So the microbiome is your gut flora inside your stomach, and it's a very sort of new area of research uh, which we're finding that it can be affected by things like the chemicals from trees, uh, what you eat, where you live, um, and it can actually start to affect things like serotonin in your brain and uh, your actual sort of pro-social and social behaviour and your connectedness to others. And of course this leads into a lot of psychedelics research. So for me it was really interesting because not only can psychedelics itself increase nature relatedness, but also increase our ability to work as a group to tackle the associated problems. I love that idea of collective intelligence, that idea that we're all neurons in a kind of bigger brain. And I, I was speaking to a friend of mine, obviously who's in California, <laughs> to be having this conversation. And I was despairing about the kind of state of the world and the environmental crisis. And he was saying, well, we're having this conversation. We're two neurons firing. But in your brain, does, does one neuron, to, does, does that neuron know the bigger picture? We, and if there's one thing about psychedelics, right, I think we could probably agree is that we realize that we don't know. I mean, immense humility <laughs> could be rapidly instilled uh, with appropriate ceremonial use of some of these substances. Um, but Danny, I'd like to ask you, because you're, you're on the front line. I mean, frankly, you're a hero to me for what you're doing out in Brazil. It's absolutely amazing. And to, to see those, the difference in, in terms of that regeneration uh, and that restoration and the difference that it makes to the people there, it's absolutely, it's, 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 
extremely moving. And I, I, I kind of want to dig a bit deeper into your process because you've been there, you've, you've been it. You've, 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 left, you've literally handed your life over to these medicines and you, you came through it. Is there a way to kind of extrapolate this in a, to, to, a, to, a, to a sort of more global scale, or, or are, we, are we in danger of getting into a kind of Terence McKenna's style flight of fantasy? We can do that, but I, I want to know from you as somebody on the ground, what do you think? Um, so I can speak from the, the certain cautions that come from my tradition on how to deal with that uh, ego expansion that uh, you mentioned, Catherine. Uh, how ritual works. So, so Daimi is a, is a collective ritual and it's designed as a collective ritual. We do it on our feet. <coughs> We're not lying in habit doing our feet. And the reason we do it on our feet is that we're learning to deal with, uh, deal with the brood, deal with ayahuasca and everything that it brings along. So all of those kind of, uh, you might call them spirits that you're working with when you're there. We, we do that on our feet and then we leave the session. So we're still on our feet and we're meant to bring that into the world, right? Um, one of the things that's very interesting about ego expansion is where does it stop? And it's very nice to hear you talking about humility because that's not often what you support. Well, often you don't see humility from people who are uh, conducting ayahuasca um, sessions, for example, or people who've got blood into their acid, or whatever it might be, because uh, ego does expand or dissolve, but then it expands into whatever container happens to be there, I think, right? So in Daimi, what do we do? We have certain rules about what you can't do when you come out of a session. One of the things you can't get missionary, you can't get messianic about it. Right? You're not allowed to invite people to our sessions. You're forbidden from doing that. You're not allowed to pick them up. You're not allowed to do what they call the Portuguese phase propaganda. Right? You can't do propaganda on the half of it. Right? So what do you do? And there's a reason for that because uh, psychedelics and not just psychedelics, but other let's say spiritual practices release. Uh, what I would call that libido in its pure form, i.e. transformational energy. Right? And it rises and it wants to sink. So it's very easy in a session to fall in love with someone, for example. It's very easy in a session to get a crazy idea into your head and then go, hey, everyone's got to do this. There was a guy, a guy who went to Peru, decided that he needed to build a seven-story pyramid in Peru, sold everything he had, kind of tried to make it happen, ended up just losing everything he had. Because you'll get an idea into your head, comes back to the idea of integration. It's very easy to get like a crazy idea or a big idea into your head on psychedelics. With Daimi, we're drinking it two weeks later again, and it will say, oi, oi, did actually what happened, what you thought would happen, did it actually happen? So we're keeping on coming back to it, right? And, and, and Daimi won't really let you hang on to those misconceptions very much the nature of it. Um, so certain things we can't do, we can't do missionary stuff, we can't, uh, uh, well, you can't have sex for three days afterwards as well, so that kind of caps the, the desperate desire to, to sink your libido in another way. Um, so, uh, when we're reconstructing rituals, we need to think, I think, quite carefully about what comes down from the rituals which are already there. Uh, we don't need to re renovate the wheels, I'm not saying we shouldn't reinvent new ones, but I think we need to kind of think of that in, in terms of community. Yeah. A lot of the Daimi songs, are, they're not so much, I mean, some of them are about spirits, and most of them are about how you deal with the guy who's next door to you when it goes wrong. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's so important to hear that, that warning, isn't it? Because <coughs> I'm sure many of us in this room know people who have become lost in the hall of mirrors that, that can open up without that container, without that careful um, grounding and integration that we've been talking about. Um, I, I'm going to move very very soon to the floor because I know a lot of people want to dive into this conversation. Um, just to kind of finish the, the circle, Sam, I mean, you, you painted this tantalizing vision of, of the power of these substances to create this sense of connection uh, that we so desperately need in so many dimensions. And I love that pollinator analogy that you brought forth the idea of a totally different approach to mental health, not this kind of top-down, hierarchical pyramid structure that we live in, in so many spheres of our lives, but something net, made of networks and pollinators, a completely different paradigm for organizing mental health and probably everything else as well. I mean, is it gonna, I mean, what would catalyze a shift? You know, we, we, uh, we've talked about this before. What, what, what would kind of make this really make an impact outside of 
that those individuals who've been lucky enough to kind of walk this path and really feel like they've taken away something really enriching for their lives and, and not fallen into the pitfalls. How, how do you operationalize that? How do you how do you take that that transcendental essence and kind of diffuse it in a in a healthy way on a bigger scale? Uh, well, yeah, that's, that's a big. Uh, we ask the big questions at the Mortuary Psychedelic Society. <laughs> um, so, yeah, firstly, like, um, yeah, very much, I think David and I pretty much dance to the beat, we're very similar drum in terms of uh, these things. But, yeah, just to sort of like, yeah, the whole aspect of psychedelics being agents of connection is a really interesting thing in the sense that they are that pretty much on all levels. So even on, even on the level of the neuron, they're, they're sort of inciting uh, neurons to form new synapses, new, new, new neurons. Uh, at the level of the brain, they're increasing uh, global total connectivity of the brain, so different regions of the brain are linking up and talking to each other in a manner they don't do when the default mode network's in charge and running the show. And then obviously, yeah, the increased connectedness to to support self, to other people, and to the na to nature and the universe. So on all levels, from the micro to the very macro, they are agents of connection. But as has been mentioned uh, before, the good, very valid point that Jacob raised is, you know, these um, these substances like they very much depend. Um, their, their power is very much dictated by the context and by the intent and by the, the seven setting. So I think moving forward, yeah, this kind of like this pollinator approach and this community embedded approach to psychedelic usage um, needs to be sort of opened up and explored. And I'm not, you know, I can't, I'm not really sure kind of like how it's going to pan out on that front because obviously it's sort of like. The current operating system uh, is quite, as you say, like feudalistic and, and capitalist, um, and sort of so we need to be creative. You know, it's the capitalist, it's the current sort of capitalist, materialist, societal paradigm was probably a big reason why everyone's sort of depressed and uh, anxious and despondent. So we want, we, we want your, your blueprint for this archaic revival <laughs> that we're waiting for. <laughs> But that'll, that'll be the next talk. Uh, yeah, that, that, is, that is kind of the whole, that is a, a whole other talk. And it will take like, we kind of need a fundamental shift in our economic political system. Uh, I'm not saying I've got all the answers to that. I've got some ideas about what we should be doing moving forward. We, we have, yeah, it seems to me we, we've got a lot of work to do and not much time, if I'm being honest. I, I, I'm going to throw it open to the floor. Um, I, there's so much that we, there's so many directions that we could take this um, that I would ask you to really ask a question if you can uh, that we can then play off rather than make a long statement. Ask a question and then uh, we'll we'll see where we can go. Sorry, is it? Uh, there was a lady three rows back. So do you have the mic? Is the, is the mic available? Hi, yeah. thank you for your talk so far. Um, my name is Rita, I'm an academic GP, uh, members of Doctors for Central Rebellion, and also a member of the Psychedelic Society. Um, in the summer, I went to a conference in the States um, about plant tree health, and an indigenous woman uh, from Indonesia stood up and sang the song of her forest. Um, her culture and her tribe is inherently connected to that forest, and she took us to that place and she took us to the suffering that was that was felt um, in that space. And so I guess my question is around the format of this panel, mm -hmm. um, where we're thinking about psychedelics and how psychedelics break down the habitual patterns and the ways in which we do things. Um, how can we take what we learn from psychedelics and put them into our academic and into our work spaces so that they're not um, predominantly left brain, male, uh, white, western, um, Yes, it's so happy to take those lines into our Thanks. Great question. Who wants to who wants to take that? <laughs> uh, represent the represent I mean I'd say okay. De just just go for it. I mean I think we, yeah we do need a kind of way in which we we just think about things intellectually like must we hold it mouth and see we're all mostly white males. But uh, 
we, we need to be in Chan the Academy as well. I think you know we've, we've lost a sense of of the sacred of, of, of magic and these kind of things. It's become very much a materialist kind of uh, endeavor. Materialist in both kind of philosophical sense of, of the theory of mind and in terms of just you know capitalist endeavor. Academies are run by businesses these days increasingly. So we need to kind of re-enchant the academy. We need to, to, to bring back these these kind of perspectives from indigenous peoples in, in, a, in a kind of wholehearted and open way, not in a kind of uh, you know a, a kind of ethnocentric, derogatory kind of perspective, whereby uh, the old language of anthropology sees our primitive cultures. You know, we need to really embrace the wisdom from other cultures uh, and, and open doors and. You know, decolonize the, the academy as well. Decolonize the academy, I should say. Yeah, um, I, I, could talk, I could talk about this for hours, and I have talked about this for hours. My last talk at Breaking Convention is called uh, Racism and Neocolonialism in the Academic Study of Ayahuasca. Um, if we want to, I think that's a great sentiment from uh, Dr. David Luke over there. Um, we need to be very aware of what the academy is built on, and the academy is built in a in, you know, you go all the way back to Plato, who was pretty much a fascist, that's where the symposium comes from. Um, and uh, if you look at, well, you know, anthropologists aren't putting uh, pygmies in cages anymore. Uh, last time they did that was 1904. Uh, but if you look at how indigenous knowledge systems are interpreted through the lens of academia, it's not pretty at all. Uh, it might have progressed to a kind of clap your hands in the way you might um, kind of applaud a child's finger painting, but when indigenous people are talking about um, the voices of spirits, for example, uh, are, is the academy listening? Because it starts off with a language where that kind of thing is called a hallucination. And hallucination is that which does not exist. So when I drink dining, I don't see that which doesn't exist, I don't see that which does exist. So I think it's, it's um, any move in that direction has to begin with an acknowledgement of how the academy is run. You know, a psychiatry, for example, used to have diseases for slaves who ran away. There was a disease for them. Um, so as an arm of the uh, in, in, uh, oppressive arm of colonialism, uh, yeah. So, so for example, if you hear a voice, I don't know what you call that in the psychiatric um, sciences, uh, if you hear a voice in the jungle, you, go, you listen to it very carefully. Right. If those voices aren't allowed into the academy, we've already, we've already extinguished indigenous voices, we're now going to extinguish voices from the astral plane as well. So I think, I think, it's, very, I think it's very useful that, 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 there's, that there's this dialogue beginning, but let's look at the history of that dialogue, let's, let's look at how indigenous people have, have, have done when they've encountered uh, the power structures of, of the Western past. Was that answer satisfying at all, or did you want to follow up? Um, yes, thank you. I'm looking forward to the next time. <laughs> what it might involve. Good. Hopefully you'll be a, a panel. Hopefully you'll be on the panel yourself. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I think also just to give Rita the, the credence for that point. The construction of this panel and the demographic represented is a failing, in some sense, the fact that we aren't that we aren't able to to come together as a community to represent it as it should be in the point that I think you're making. And that is not to do with how this came about as an evening, but it's also the choice that each of us has made to come to this panel, to agree, and to not put other people forward, or to not stand and say that, well, I, I think I would be good for this, however, I think someone else would be better, or actually, I don't think I want to be involved unless you get someone else involved. And that's always going to be, and I think that's a good example of the power of community. So it's not, the, the intention is to here to have this amazing event, but it has to come from us as well. I think to do justice to the point that you've made. The other thing I would say is, well, this, this point of, coming into contact with an experience through song, and not necessarily through psychedelic experience, but perhaps reaching a similar place. I think there's a lot to be said there. I mean, I'm going to make a, a shameless plug for a, an amazing ecologist by the name of David Abram, who speaks very much about the spell of the sensuous, and very much talks about how this connection to nature, this interconnectedness, is always accessible to us at every single moment. And really the barrier is the kind of relationship we have with language. Um, and then you could sort of see song as being something that would, through the emotive aspect of it, allow us to get there. But I think, again, it's this, this idea that we can reach that through psychedelics, but there, it's almost like it's there looking at us the whole time, right? Um, so, I think, again, um, Sam talked about the interconnected, the impact of natural spaces on us, if we just allow it to happen. And I think there has to be space for that discussion as well. And perhaps a question of why do we look to psychedelics so much for an answer and the answer perhaps is always available with a bit of a different perspective, I think, so. Yeah. I was going to add that, so there's one 
Other things is about accessibility and everybody, it is privileged to, to have free space where you can talk about psychedelics, psychedelics. Um, and psychedelics, like Sam said, is not for everybody in a lot of the world. And I do love actually think that the National Schools Network, um, technologists, people like Marshall and Laser Feast, looking at creating experiences, uh, living psychedelic experiences that can be sort of sent to schools um, and everyone has access to it or people who don't want to take psychedelics just to help me actually reach a much bigger sort of uh, you know, uh, demographic because it is, you know, it's a very particular demographic. He talks about this um, by nature of, of where the world is at the moment. Thank you. Yes. Um, hi, my name is Wendy. Uh, I'm a student, and um, so my friends were interested in psychedelics, and I have talked to a few professors in different um, schools and in different disciplines about psychedelics. And uh, to me, it feels like, at least in academia, professors often feel like even if they are interested in psychedelics, they don't really talk about it with other with their colleagues and. Um, one of them said that they feel like psychedelics is associated with a sort of like uncritical, according to them, un uncritical openness that is not consistent with um, academic research, uh, serious academic research. And um, I was kind of wondering, like in terms of like, um, but, but but obviously like, you know that there are that there have been um, more and more research in psychedelics in different uh, disciplines that are serious research. And so I kind of was wondering like, for uh, um, for like anyone who's, uh, who has like, thoughts on this, like how can psychedelics be more, I guess, like, integrated into the whole academic system? How could how could it be established more as like, a legitimate topic to study? Great question. Yeah, so how, yeah, how can psychedelics be kind of given more legitimacy within the academic establishment? Yes, yeah, yes. great question. Who would like to jump in? Anyone? I've always got lots of thoughts on this. <laughs> I think Dr. David Luke Sorry, should yeah, be okay. given the, the, the mic. I'm trying to keep it brief. But being an academic in, you know, and, and working within the academy now, trying to change perceptions about it, so we start off by doing a, a psychedelic conference, uh, which is kind of growing, growing, growing. You know, we've had 1,500 people come this year and hundreds of researchers from all around the world. So it is kind of mushrooming, it's becoming more and more accepted. And acceptable, but uh, there's still those perceptions of obviously it hasn't kind of permeated through every kind of filter of the academy as yet. Uh, but it's an interesting <laughs> thing, you know, that so when I first kind of did, did this breaking convention in the Psychedelic Conference at British University, I was kind of concerned about coming out of the closet and what my colleagues would think uh, because they didn't really know what I did or was interested in. And sure enough, the, so the media card put it on the, on the kind of university news web feed, and it's like, oh god, that's it, I've turned me out now. And, and I, for the rest of the week, I'm getting a knock at my door, and one of my colleagues would come along and they'd look, like, for his first of all, they'd peer around the door and go, oh wow, this conference you're doing, it's really cool. Did I ever tell you about it? I'm not about And then they could check one of my department did that. So there's kind of like, there's a different stream of private and public views. And I think we're, we're kind of just, Continue beginning to change those uh, things like you know, psychedelic societies. There's lots of these popping up at, at universities, and as we do it from the bottom up, it's like the students are interested in this, so why shouldn't the academics be? And of course, now the way that academies are being run as businesses, they, they fall over themselves to try and please students. However, as yet, there is no tall courses on, on, on studying psychedelics, as yet, I do plan to try and change that soon. Uh, so, just continually, we have to just kind of normalise it really and it is becoming increasingly normalised to be interested in also the psychedelics. Um, yeah, just uh, I think yeah things are definitely kind of thawing uh, in a lot of circles overall and like yeah I mean we you know from the research that the psychedelics do make you more open but I don't think you need to leave your, your rationality or your rationality at the door. At least when you come back from the experience maybe you best to leave it. Uh, by the door on the way into it. Um, but I had, there was an interesting one of my colleagues from the Beckley Foundation um, went to a conference, um, I think in, in Berlin, a psychedelic conference, and she was a bit disconcerted. And she's, a, she's an Oxford Imperial PhD neuroscientist, so she, she knows her stuff. And, but she was a bit concerned about the, the scientific community, they were kind of dismissing the mystical 
components for psychedelic experience. And I spoke at a Zoom chat with this guy, uh, Tony Bossis, uh, like a week ago. And Tony's kind of pretty much the world expert on using psilocybin to treat existential anxiety uh, and existential distress. And he echoed those sentiments independently. And so, and this is something we sort of like, I think we need to be a little bit mindful of. We're much, on this side of the Atlantic, we're definitely more like spiritual phobic than they are uh, in the States. And we, I think we need to be, be a bit careful that like, psychedelics are not, they're not just a pill that you pop and it does something and then you get better. It's like, it's something that you pop that you then have potentially this deep, powerful transformative experience that then kind of affects your perspective and how you navigate life from, from then on. So yeah, we know all the research has been done in clinical populations, so addiction, existential distress, depression, as well as like healthy people. It's been this mystical experience, call it whatever you want, peak transcendent mystical experience. That is the key long-term mediator of, of positive effects. So I don't think we should dismiss the power of that experience, whatever labels we want to apply. Yes, we may argue about, or not argue, but debate how the mechanism of these experiences, but we also need to remember that, that you know, consciousness is the thing that's behind the entire scientific endeavor and science that you get to come in and close to defining what consciousness is, let alone mystical experiences. Thank you. Um, I was just going to say, I think one sure way of doing that is to capitalize it. And so once you start tying any treatment to capital, it starts becoming more legitimate. But I think that's something that the psychedelic field has to come to terms with and understand how it's going to relate to. So I say that with a degree of caution, because I think that it's a question that as the field becomes more mature, it will increasingly have to know how to position itself towards that and what compromises it's willing to take on if it's going to relate itself to, I guess, the promise of that kind of, of a system. So. Once it is monetized, of course, it will become much more, as you know, be more available and be more spoken of and be more normalized, but at a, at a substantial cost, um, no pun intended, I think. So I think that that's something that, that, I think that is a quick way to normalize, but again, the field has to be really sensitive to how it relates to that. Uh, gentleman at the back, got the mic. <coughs> So, um, to talk about a non-profit, like um, medication almost, um, obviously I guess that comes down to microdosing or things like that, but you also talk about a ceremonial experience when it comes to um, psychedelics. Do you think it's possible to develop them into a form of medication, or do you think it's that sense of awe and cere the ceremonial experience that is what gives them the power to be sort of, um, to give that connectedness? My yeah, Matt, great question. Is it, is it possible to turn these medicines into more almost conventional yeah, forms exactly. of drugs, or yeah. do they have to be approached through a more sacred ceremonial context? Yeah. Lots of views on that question. Who wants to take that one? <laughs> well, my, my just comment to working with the in Richmond and what it means and you know, we've got ourselves a complete swamp actually trying to understand Richard and the question of whether or not it can stand below. I know Samuel Charles and um, you know, we've talked about how much you have Richard in your trials even if you're putting them through a you know an MRI scan. Would you like to explain what we do? Um, okay, that's um, so yeah no, that's kind of, it's kind of an interesting question. So just I'm maybe taking a little bit of a tangent here. Uh, but there are certain like rituals uh, in place. We even now how psilocybin is administered both here on the other side of the Atlantic. So there is reference made to the indigenous usage um, of these uh, things. But we know from the research, even in a very clinical environment, connectedness is increased. So it does appear to be a fun same with nature of connection. It seems to be a fundamental uh, effect of, of the psychedelic experience. But, I really think there is something to be said for what you're saying in terms of when it's not necessarily, well, yeah, I guess when it's used in a kind of more ceremonial, and with that ceremonial context, we come as a community of people taking it together. And I think there is something to be said for that. I know there's been research on the, on the Santa Dame and the Arabic users there. And 
yeah, when our ass is used in a community, a sort of, yeah, like supportive community setting like that, there seems to be much more benefits and enduring benefits that people take away from those experiences compared to, say, yeah, if you're on their own or something like that. So, yeah, psychedelics are very kind of amorphous and flexible tools. And I don't think, you know, I don't think there's any particular right way. I think the medical model, the shamanic model, and then the sort of more ceremonial model, these are all sort of different uh, and potentially valid and non-competing paths to, to using psychedelics. We're going to have time for a couple more. Uh, lady at the front, please. <laughs> Hi, I'm Serena. Um, so I actually study neuroscience here at King's. I do masters, um, and there's obviously no kind of influence in regards to this topic on what I do. So I've just kind of gone off reading books and papers and going to all these talks, and I attend the UCL Psychedelic Society and just trying to kind of get involved. Um, but I, I found that trying to get into research is very difficult with. Um, psychedelics and especially if you're considering PhDs um, and a lot of kind of researchers have said that they make a name for themselves first and then they go into psychedelics because of it. Um, so for like someone who would like to go into this field, what do I do? <laughs> like how would you, how, how, how would you even start? Psychedelic career advice. Who <laughs> <laughs> would like to offer some? Sounds like one for David. I was just going to say, just, just quickly, so I'm, you know, um, my way of kind of, sort of getting into this field, so I, I kind of had a, I worked as a scientific assistant at the Beckley Foundation, and yeah, as of this year, I'm a collaborator, I was about to be a collaborator of the Imperial College group, and that kind of, like, exactly as you're doing, really, like, that kind of all came off my own back and my own interests, so. So reading, researching, but also, uh, in my case, I enjoy writing about these things. And breaking convention, David's conference has been played a really important role, I think. I've been part of that community and speaking there, and then getting to know people who are working in the field. And that's kind of like, in time, that's kind of snowballed. And I, I, I'm trying to be quite open about my interests and perspectives as well. I don't kind of hide it away. <laughs> I think that's, that's been quite helpful actually. I know some people say, well, it's a risky thing to do, but it's only sort of benefited me personally. So, yeah, that's my perspective on that. I'd like to uh, answer that question. <coughs> and also the last question as well. I'm, kind of, I'm going to um, uh, perhaps respond in a slightly unfair way because you're asking for something slightly different. But I think we need to look at what is research and what is, again, what is ritual, right? Because in, uh, in, in certain parts of the jungle, you've got your feathers to the ritual, we might even need to be got a tie. I don't want you wear when you go to work, but um, I imagine there are certain ritualistic aspects of how you, you, know, you put your card in and when you do all that stuff. This is what ritual is. Ritual is something you do. Brushing your teeth is a ritual, shaving your face is a ritual. Um, all tribes have taboos in, in, in Alaska, and there might be different tribes between different, different taboos between different tribes, but most of them will have something about sex, most of them will have something about certain types of food. Uh, in the West, uh, we have taboo on um, Alaska, is you shouldn't take SSRIs before you take it. There's meant to be a contraindication between uh, antidepressants. Uh, there is no evidence for this at all. This was come up in uh, 1996, Halloween Grob. So we've got over 20 years of time to work out whether this is true or not. Still doing the ritual. What? We're still doing that ritual. Yeah, we're still doing the ritual. Yeah, exactly. We're still, we still have to do it. If you, go, if you want to go and drink uh, ayahuasca, one of the first things they'll ask you is, are you on SSRI? If you say yes, they'll say you can't drink it then. Why not? Because of serotonin syndrome. Where's the evidence? There is none. There's none at all. There's some people, loads of people who can drink it. Uh, anyway, I make this point because I want to talk about how we already are in a shrine. In the academy, it already has its own kind of tribal um, ways. And like all other tribes, it's very jealous of its own ways, all right? Particularly around this idea of knowledge, right? There was, um, in sociology of science, which is what I studied, there was a particular um, sociologist, I actually know his name now, but he, just, he, he looked at what academics do and he said, well, they, they produce paper. 
And so that's the, the cash crop is paper. And if that's what you do, you generate knowledge, you know, this head of the house next has something about the kind of taboos around corn. Uh, academics have a whole lot of taboos around paper, right? And other people's knowledge. So I would answer your question. If you want to really understand psychedelics, right? I've studied psychedelics, I, you know, I've studied psychedelics very, very closely for 18 years, and it involves drinking it and stepping from side to side in very, very long rituals. Yeah. Um, I think that's, that's a real good way of getting into this field, is take those things, take large doses, take those things. <laughs> <laughs> Cut me off! Outside. I know there's other people in the room who have uh, had uh, experiences in the jungle which they then brought back into the academy. I published my first uh, journal paper a couple of months ago, peer reviewed. There's, there's, uh, I'm not the doctor, the doctor's all up at him. I'm not the doctor, I'm not the doctor. I'm not the So, what I would say is go for the substances, go for the cultures, learn about them, and then maybe you might have something to offer. Sorry, I'm sure you've got something to offer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you might have more to offer if you can't really come back. Can I have just a point to, not his point, but yes, bring back to the book? Yes, yes, yes. I'm bringing back the book. So the one thing that was really interesting when we studied the ritual, um, we were saying we have rituals, is that in our men profession we do have rituals. You know, the white coat, and even the sort of dry studies that you were doing, there was a ritual, and if you take that, Ritual out because it's about values, and we wouldn't be careful not trying to just adopt other tribes' rituals because you know then it doesn't become this sort of uh, touristic thing and 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 acknowledge what rituals we have in our own mental society and, and how they do actually make us feel better and they enhance the effect of those drugs as well. We've got time for one final question before we come to all our conclusions. <laughs> Looking at the back, someone at the back on the left, yeah. I just listen to everything. I don't think the problem is inside the academy of like converting people to become more open to psychedelics. It's outside of the academy. So normal people, people that watch you send us every night and do normal day jobs, people who don't come to talks like this, for instance. How do we no, it's not just for psychedelics, it's for climate change as well. Like how do we uh, kind of talk to those people to say that there's a really big problem here, psychedelics can help, because I find it difficult to talk to my own parents and make them become more open to these things. Apart from like talking about experiences over Christmas dinner, like what do we do to kind of open the conversation to yeah, normal everyday working people? Um, because I think Extinction Rebellion were trying to do something with the end of the rebellion where they wanted to take a symbolic dose of psychedelic mushrooms in the street, and I personally don't think that's the right way. Um, I think that could potentially be really damaging. So other than having conversations with family members, which is very difficult, or Facebook conversations with people outside of the bubble, what do we do? Spine horror. I'm not very much on your page. And you know, with the, if, yeah, the, the Gales extinction rebellion mass psychedelic dosing thing, I don't think that's like a helpful like, thing to propose at, at this time. Um, so, I mean, it's interesting just to use the case study of the decriminalization movements kind of popping up now in the, in the US. Um, and so it's interesting because the, the Denver vote just took it. And then the vote in Oakland was a different thing. It was like all organic psychedelics were unanimously decriminalized by the council there. And they say when you're sort of like talking, yeah, interfacing with members of the public, um, people who were like anti psychedelic and like skeptical or like, they were, they were willing and did change their minds. Um, when presented with evidence that they weren't otherwise previously aware of. And it was a council decision, um, it was a test of these people who per had had personal transformations and the scientific evidence um, stemming, like that kind of really fueled that. So, yeah, I think the psychedelic culture does 
um, exists in the bubble, but I think that bubble is growing to encompass more. I think Michael Collins' book was, was quite really important in that regard, in terms of building bridges outside the bubble. So, and I'm encountering more and more people who weren't in the bubble until very recently. So I think it is, things are shifting. We have a few more words from Danny and then no, oh, I'll just say, I mean, if like it's if it's the East End or watching some masses, you want to change, then we need to have, you know, Ian B or the Mitchell brothers or something like that. Like, get, having like psychedelic psychotherapy on East End, or maybe the actors themselves, you know, the people having psychedelic psychotherapy, you know. So, why is it that, you know, the media, the, the news, has reported all these kind of great positive psychedelic news stories, and yet we don't see the kind of cultural shift in, in mainstream media in terms of our, our television, you know, soaps. Well, has anybody ever kind of had a kind of positive psychedelic therapeutic experience in a soap before? Why, why not? Why aren't school writers doing that? They're probably all tricking themselves, you know. Uh, so why isn't that actually kind of filtered through? That, that shift needs to happen, I think. So if you write three centers, <laughs> it's really well, the, the question and the, the conference generally. <clears throat> the conference generally really brought some questions up. For me personally, um, I, I, I met this guy who turned out to be a Mormon bishop uh, who wanted to give us some money and he was really, really excited about everything we were doing. And then uh, next time I spoke to him, he was like a mile away. I think he might look me up and uh, found out you know, what my hobbies are. Um, so, this is a really interesting, I think it's a really interesting thing, Amy. Uh, I don't think it's that important to try and uh, to, do, to do missionary work. I think it's more important in the environmental scene than the uh, psychedelic scene. But I reckon, personally, I'm liking that, you know, like I said, it's the first time I've used my proper name at a conference. And I'm just trying to work out personally which way I'm going to do this. Am I going to embrace the psychedelic community uh, and try and make a uh, charitable endeavour? Or am I going to, am I going to keep my funding uh, pots, uh, funding streams a little bit cleaner by not embracing it? So um, here's one thing which I'd really encourage people in the psychedelic community to do. Give me money. <laughs> uh, give me money. Right? There are 100 people here in the room before the, before the end. If you all bought me a coffee once a week, uh, I'd, be able to, I, I'd be able to finance two nurseries a month. If you bought me an egg once a week, I'd be able to finance what it would be like uh, a couple every week. Yeah? So get behind the people, not just me, you know, the other people are doing stuff, coming out of the psychedelic community and like applying it, you know, uh, just get behind us and do what you can, not just money as well. So there's volunteers out there and you need a load of help, right? A load of help, not like we need a load of help. So you need to get together, do what it says in that wonderful animation that that guy over there. Connect it up and like, you know, keep it doing. Um, I was going to say an answer to what you said. I mean, I've been just bringing us back to what Dan spoke about and those wild images of change that were happening in the area that you've been working in, but also um, what Sam talked about. I mean, the whole thing that we're talking about is talking because of climate change. And then when you look at activism generally, people who are moved to change, then this apparently one of the single most important factors is someone who you know in that network who's already done that. Right, something that comes from sort of power and interconnectedness in of itself. Um, I mean, I, for example, started working um, and helping with XR because of friends of mine, and I wasn't involved with them prior. And I, I single-handedly fit down to that to that factor. I mean, I was thinking about it and talking about it, but it was because I knew people. And so when we're talking about the others and the other people, it's about I think trying to do our best to to find that common ground because people will follow um, if they feel like there's enough of a if there's enough of a sense of community because that's what we do. Um, Beautifully put, and I, I'd like everyone to join me in thanking the incredible panel, Dr. Sam Gandhi, Dr. David Lee. <laughs>